Hello, um, today I want to talk about um, something from the Gospel, something you're all very familiar with, but I want us to think about it in a different way. And I just want you to try and keep an open mind. And what we're going to look at today and think about in depth is the story in the, the Gospels of Jesus feeding the 5,000 people in the desert, right? And he did this by, we presume, multiplying the loaves and the fishes. This is something you're all very familiar with. Um, I was a Jewish believer in Jesus for 42 years, and uh, I've never really had this explored much in depth. The idea is it, it was a miracle. There was never any discussion of how it could have happened, what were the mechanisms of it happen, happening, and so on. Never any deep ex exploration. It's just like, you just believe it. This happened, you've no idea how it happened. It just happened. That's it. You believe it uh, but I will want to show you today uh, from actually from the Hebrew scriptures that it, it is actually possible to quite understand quite a lot about the miracles of God and what the question is today regarding the story of Jesus feeding um, the 5,000 with the loaves and fishes is the question is was this a miracle or was this magic right was this a miracle or was it magic well we've all watched tele television magicians empty hat empty hat and then suddenly they're bringing out rabbits and you're thinking well where they come from How many times have you seen it on television? I can remember from a child so many times. You think, where's it all coming from, all these rabbits? <laughs> One after the other. They're alive. You can see them. They're holding them and everything. It's incredible. So. First of all, we're going to start with the Hebrew Scriptures, looking at some very common miracles that you're all very familiar with. Everybody knows about these miracles. Because these are the template that reveal how God works and how he doesn't work. What is a miracle? What what God is trying to show us through the miracle. Now, we're going to start with Noah, Noah's Ark. So God says to Noah, build an ark, you know, go to flood the earth. So how does God flood the earth? He does it by pouring rain. So he's taking control, of, he's in control of the elements, everything, isn't he, God? So the water's pouring down, pouring down, pouring down, pouring down. But what's happening is excessive. In other words, it doesn't stop. It just continues and continues and continues. Heavy, heavy, heavy rains. And it continues so excessively that the whole earth is, is flooded, right? So God is taking control of the elements and he has got them to work in a sort of overkill, an overdramatic way. In other words, it's like, wow, you know, nobody could make flood the earth. The only person that could do this is God, because he's in, in control of the weather and the sky and the, the, every, the whole thing. So this is God taking control and flooding the earth, right? And then what happens is the sun comes out and 
God stops the rain and what happens when the rain stops and the sun comes out is the floods recede because you hear around the world floods all around the world is flooding isn't it the rain stops the sun comes out the floods recede and this is what happened at the time of Noah exactly the same but it was on a bigger scale obviously because the whole earth was flooded right the next great miracle i can remember as a child a jewish child at cheder the equivalent of sunday school is moses goes to pharaoh let my people go let them go out into the desert to worship god and he's, he's trying to show pharaoh the power of the god of god so he throws moses throws down his staff right which will have been made of wood remember it will have originated from wood and wood originates from the earth and what happened is it turned into a snake right but then what happened was pharaoh's magicians got their staffs and threw it down threw them down and guess what they also turned into snakes now, as a child, I imagined there's Moses' snake and there's the magician's snakes, right? And you kind of think they're all equal. But you see, what happened in the story is that M Moses' snake, which is representing the power of God, right, speaking in the name of God, you know, the authority, as, you know, telling Pharaoh to let the Jewish people to go into the wilderness to, to worship God. You know, he's, he's showing the supremacy of, the, of, of God over all his uh, magicians and what have you. This snake of, of Moses eats up all these other snakes. Now, that means that Moses' snake and these other snakes of the magicians were not, not the same. As a child, I thought they were all the same. As you do, you're thinking, there we are. But Moses' snake ate up all the other snakes. Now, to do this, because the way nature is, this snake would have to be bigger, stronger and more powerful to overcome all these other snakes to eat them. Now, at first glance, you might think the magician's snakes and the Moses' snakes are the same. The snakes, you know, what's the difference? The snake's a snake. No, 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 no. There is a difference. The difference is this snake is more powerful and stronger that it overpowers all these other snakes and eats them all up, right? They appear the same, but they are not the same. There's obviously something different about this snake of Moses, right? And I would liken it to counterfeit money. When you look at counterfeit money and you're comparing it to a dollar or a pound note, you think, well, which just looks the same. It's... Well, it's supposed to look the same. That's no point. <laughs> There's no point doing counterfeit money if it, if it doesn't look the same. It's supposed to look the same because it's counter. It's supposed to look the same. But an expert who knows what a dollar really looks like and examined it thoroughly knows a pound note and a note or any other currency. They know it. They scrutinise it there with a magnifying. They know everything on that note. Right? They are experts on the currency. They know everything. They will be able to pick up a counterfeit dollar or pound note and say that is a fake. That is a fake. You and I don't know what's a fake. We think it's about the same. And so do people in the shops. That's why they get away with it. But the expert, because they know what the real thing is, the real 
what a real dollar, a real pound note looks like. They can recognise the counterfeit. And what my argument is, if you can know and recognise how God works and what is the template, what is the authenticity, how do you decide what is from God and what is not from God? Because this is very difficult, remember, because if you've got magicians who are basically trying to imitate God. Moses is saying, trying to show this is God's power, the snake, and the magicians are coming back and saying, well, we're, you know, we're this, we're, we're, we're we can do it, you know. But this is showing that that snake was different. It was bigger, it was stronger, it was more powerful. And if you'd examined that snake, you would have realised that. If you were a snake expert, you would know that snake is going to eat all them for breakfast. Literally eat them for breakfast. Literally eat them for breakfast. Right? Now, the children of Israel have been told to flee from Egypt, they've been told not to take anything with them. They don't know yet the reason why God has said don't take anything with them. The reason is, as we know later on in the story, in the desert, that God wants to show his mighty power through miracles to provide for them with food and water, right, to meet their needs. Don't take anything with you. Don't take a trolley on wheels to rush out to the Red to the Red Sea. Don't go there with your little trolley on wheels. Don't go with your backpack. No, 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 you don't go with your backpack. Everybody trudging out of Egypt with the backpacks and the little trolleys on wheels. Get to get to, we've got to get to flee from Egypt. No, 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 go with nothing. So they arrive with nothing at the Red Sea. An ocean, it's an ocean. So imagine you're standing in front of an ocean. It parts. How does it part? How does it part? Water does not go upright of itself, does it? Now think. Take, put water, put it in a glass, a long glass. What have you got? A long glass of water. Get another glass, put some water in it, and you've got another glass of water. You've got two glasses of water. So what God did, in his mighty power, he took control of the sea, and that which normally is flowing like that, in his great power, is able to harness the, the sea and have it upright like as if it's in a glass of water but a long glass of water can you see can you visualize it imagine it something long there a long structure that's high it's being contained it's being contained can you can you see that um try to show it you sort of it's a long glass and it's stretching out there the long glass upright the water's upright. It's like putting loads of glasses of water one after the other. Right. And there's you've got a whole line of glasses of water. The, all the water's upright because it's in a glass. And that's what God has done. He's moved the sea apart and made it. He's harnessed, taken the sea apart. How did he do that? One way he could have done it is through the wind. The power of the wind. The power of the wind can separate. It's very powerful, the wind, what it can do. I've seen just myself in, in just my back garden, the power of the wind where I live. I had a brick wall. And the power of the wind knocked, would you believe it? I couldn't believe it. All the bricks over. I couldn't believe it. How, is it, how could a wind do that? And this is in just in Yorkshire, in the north of England. 
an ordinary, you know, winter's day. A very, very blustery, windy day. And it knocked the wall over and all the bricks were everywhere. And they're so heavy. Each brick is heavy. It weighs a ton. How does it manage to push all the... I'd never seen anything like this before. Um, I've, I've seen the, the, the wind lifting up things. And you've seen it on television. It lifts up a car and has it overturning. And it's taking it on a journey. You're thinking, wow. <laughs> I've seen it with my dustbin. I mean, it's so surreal. You can't believe it. It's, 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 it is funny. You see your dustbin, big dustbin in the garden. And it's being picked up by the wind and it's rolling down the street. That's my dustbin. <laughs> You've got to get money. You're trying to run after your dustbin. <laughs> That's the power of the wind. So, I mean, that, I mean, um, you know, and we've seen it on television, help with the power of the wind, what it can do. So I think it's quite easily explainable that God is got the wind and parted the Red Sea and then he's got it held upwards. So if you've seen Hollywood films by the you know of the Reading of the Cross Sea, they do it like that. They have it so that the sea is upright. It's and it is actually um it has it's actually very convincing. I look at that and I think yes I see that in the film, and I say, that, I bet that's how it happened. It is looks water. You see people walking through, obviously, they're, they're going through mud, and it's wet, and there's puddles and things, obviously. It's not, like, totally dried out. Obviously, it's still wet, and it's the feet are getting wet, and it's puddly and things, but the, it's two sides of upright water. So God is, by his mighty power with the wind, separated it, kept this the waves upright and the children of Israel have gone through then when they've gone through he closes it behind them just as they've gone through then he closes it the water comes starts to come down probably it probably as they came through right onto dry land on the other side what would what would have probably happened would be it would be slowly begin to come down again because that's when the uh, pharaoh's army unfortunately and all those lovely horses perished I mean, it's terrible i mean it's terribly sad all those men and all those horses having to die like that because pharaoh wouldn't let the jewish people to go out in the desert to worship god you know so innocent people suffered because Pharaoh wouldn't let the Jewish people go into the desert to worship God, you know. It's nothing to rejoice about, that side of it. It's it's awful. And because they, women and, you know, the families left behind. There's always casualties, you see, um, in things like that. Because he, he he'd, Moses had demonstrated his might, the power of God, and, you know, he saw... The, the, the magician snakes were eaten up by Moses' snake, and that that was a, that should have been a wake up call to Pharaoh. But at first he he said go, and then he changed his mind, back down. You know he said go go go. You know he's panicking. Oh, is it? You know go go go. You know he's frightened because he's seen the snake eat all the magician snakes, and he has a change of heart because he's probably thinking. No, it's, it's all my labour. It's my slave labour. I can't let these, these people go. So they arrive on dry land, right? And what happens? Um, these are people that <clears throat> have ha are working. They're, they're slaves in Egypt, that they are working. They are getting food at a particular time. They are getting fed and watered at a particular time. Um, and as happens, everybody starts moaning. <laughs> You've got nothing with you because God said don't take anything into the desert. 
you haven't got you haven't got your trolley full of you know your your bottled water and you've got your pack sandwiches and you've got your package of crisps and you made this and, no no god has said don't take anything nothing you've got nothing nothing you've got no bottled water you know there's nothing to swig nothing and everybody starts moaning because that's what people do and they're frightened as well you see but the moaning and then we've got the water coming from the rock now water comes from underground right think of wells think of water supplies coming up from the ground right the water's there in the in the ground and what god did in the desert was he brought it to the surface he brought it to the surface the water was there in the ground it was already there and he brought it up to the surface so he's t again taking control of nature of the natural the water's there but god is just bringing it there and i i'm backtracking but this also is about the plagues that God sent. Think about the locusts, right? Where did these locusts come from? I'll tell you where they came from. They came from the ground, underneath the ground. They were all there. And what happened? God got them all to come out at once. There weren't just a few coming up and the others staying in bed. I can't be bothered going out there. You know, I'm sleeping <sighs> underground. Sleeping locusts. No, no, no. What God did, he got them all out. Right, all of you, I want you out. Out! Get out there. No, we want to sleep. No, no get out there. So God is in, in control again. He's, te he's getting these locusts that are buried underground. Right, all of you, out, 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 out. And they're all over the place. <laughs> so God is managing everything. You see. So he's harnessing the natural turning the water you know in Egypt to blood again there might have been something in that water that God multiplied or God did something to get it to develop and grow and I, 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 can, I can see that happening very slowly it wouldn't be like oh one minute it's clear and the next minute it's blurred it would no 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 it would probably be very gradual is that water pink it looks pink to me. Does it look pink to you? Or is it the light? Then you come back like, it's getting redder. What is it? You, you see, I, that would happen gradually. Because that's the way nature is, isn't it? It takes you by surprise. It's gradual, but it's quick. If you see what I mean, it's a bit like, you know, you look out the window. It could be 5.30 and it's, it's pitch black in the morning. And then, but 10 minutes later, you look out and it's lighter. You think, well, it was so dark ten minutes ago, and now it's lighter. And I think this is perhaps how it was with the waters in Egypt becoming like blood, becoming to blood. It's sort of water turning into blood, you see. Let's get back to the desert. Now, think about the manna that God provided in the desert. The, the dew, which was on the... the the ground and they picked it up and it's hmm, sort of like wheatish it would have a wheatish taste remember bread comes from the earth right this is the origin of bread it comes from the earth it comes from wheat which it grows in the earth it all comes from the earth so that dew on the land in the desert that the children of Israel discovered in the morning what's that over there and as people do go over 
What is it? What's it taste like? Ooh, it tastes like bread. It tastes like like it's like wheat. It's like flour. It's like and again, God is using the he's he's t harnessing again the natural earth, which is his domain, and that's where it comes from. Bread actually comes from the ground. It comes from the ground. What they were tasting was that which if you got it all together you'd sort of make it almost like a loaf they would have gathered it together and they might have been looking for, for herbs or something in the desert because there might well have been leaves and different things like you know people, that's what people do they might well have started should we put a bit of this in do you think that's safe <laughs> and start adding it to this juice stuff that tastes slightly wheaty you know the bread right the flour you know it's this is this is this is it it's come from the earth so the miracles of god here we're seeing and this is what is so fantastic about them is how god is managing the um, all the elements of the world he's, he's the weather he's taking control of so he can flood the earth and then he can dry the earth he's providing the food the manna in the desert bread comes from the flower so he's providing it every day for 40 years this is happening from the earth he's providing manna from the earth for the children of Israel. He's providing them bread from the, this is bread by all definite it is bread. It is it, it will it's wheat. It's wheat. Um it is the same. It's a, it's the wheat. You see? You get all that duty all that stuff together. You I mean it's just shaping it it's bread. It's you know that's it. Um they might well have cooked it. They might, they might add things to it, they might try and cook it. You know, people are ingenious, we are ingenious. We try, what can we do with this to make it more interesting? And we've got God parting, taking control of even the ocean and parting it by his mighty power. Then we've got God providing meat in the desert. So we've got God in control of the birds. In control of the birds. There are birds out there, right? There are birds everywhere. But God directs all the birds, right? You're going over here. I want you over here. He directs them. He's taking control of the birds and he's getting them to be over the children of Israel. And they're falling down, right? Dead, right? And I could, I could visualise this. You see... You're out there in the desert, suddenly, oh, it, oh look, oh, it's dropped, oh, oh, go over. It's meat, this is meat. It's a bird, it's, it's a chicken, you, whatever it is, it's, it's, it's meat, right? And then you say, oh, look, oh, another one's over there, can you see that over there? And then suddenly, different ones are dropping, they're dropping. But I should, even, I can see this happening quite in a sense naturally, but it's supernatural in the sense of, it's so incredible. It's like, wow, look, there's another one over there. Oh, there's some more over here. And you walk round and you turn up, oh, there's more drops over here. You know, it, it, it's like an exaggeration. It's like, you know how you, you might see one bird flop to the, to the ground? This is an exaggeration. It's like more and more coming. It's like the locusts, where you're not just getting one or two, three or four. You suddenly got a whole load of them coming from the earth. And this is God's power. He's getting them all out. Not just one or two, all of them. He's getting them all out there. And he's getting all the birds. And he's getting them to all flow over them. And he's getting them to drop and everything. So they're going to be fed. And this is where... This is the mighty power of God. And this is why God, in the God of the uh, 
the God of Israel in the ancient world was very revered and respected because of these miracles. He was known. He was known for his mighty power. His reputation went before him. And this is, they, they were full of awe. And this is why people did convert to Judaism. And even men would get circumcised. Grown men would und undergo circumcision. No, you know, it's, it's very painful for a man to do that, but they, they would be so impressed and so impressed and so in awe of this God of Israel that can feed the children of Israel, that's providing them water, you know, for 40 years. That somehow the clothes and the shoes are not wearing out, everything's lasting. He's making things last. Things aren't wearing out. So he's obviously strengthening fabric and things, so it's not getting worn, you see. So he's keeping everything strong, isn't he? So it's not like people are walking around in ranks, it's like everything is strengthened. The shoes, which would, whatever they were made of, would have been kept strong. And everything is about um, um, how can I explain it taking control of the natural right we have to contrast this with the story of Jesus in the desert uh, in the wilderness in the um, the feeding of the 5,000 with the loaves and fishes, right? What we're told in this story is that obviously Jesus has gone out into the desert to preach. Now you have to remember about this story. The, the gospel here is about trying to persuade Jewish people that Jesus is the Messiah that he's been sent by God and that he is the Messiah. Right? And that he can do miracles and everything. So this is the work of the Gospel writer is to try and persuade the reader and the listener, the listener, that this is the expected Messiah. Right? So this book is written in order to persuade people to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. So we're told that Jesus goes out into the desert to preach. Now I'm thinking the practicalities of this because if he's going out into the desert to preach, how far away from the city or town would he be when he's doing this? Because remember, the people that are going to come out to, to listen to him are going to be families, they're going to be men women children and babies because if you're going out to listen to somebody you're going to take the whole family you know it's that the whole family is going to go to listen to this preacher surely from jesus's point of view he would not want to be too far away from what you might call civilization or from the nearest town or the nearest little village or whatever near because all these people have got to schlep they've all got to go out into the desert apparently to listen to jesus so the distance can't be that great so in other words you have a desert area but how far did he go in other words there is a beginning and an end to a desert there's a beginning of an, a desert and there's an end to a desert right so if Jesus is here, this is the beginning, how far into the desert is he going? Is he just there? He might have just he just might be on the edge of the desert. That would make more sense if you are going to do public speaking, which is what it was. He was a public preacher. And the purpose of preaching is to preach to the population, which will be men, women, children, families. And families travel distances. And he has to be somewhere where they can all gather. There's enough space for everybody to gather. 
but um, but not too far into the desert because people have got to, to get there and make the journey. You see, there's no O2 there. There's no Carnegie Hall. This, you know, he is he is go uh, We presume he's going. He's picking the desert because he wants a lot of people to be present to listen to him. So he's picking a big arena. So he's, that's why he's chosen the desert area. So there's the beginning of the desert. I would presume he'd just be about here, wouldn't he? Just, you know, he's just up there, you know, just at the beginning of the desert. You wouldn't be going right into the desert. I mean, I can't expect him to go right into the desert and expect men, women, children, families with the babies and all the rest of it, schlepping, trekking, trekking, trekking a mile, two miles right into the desert to listen to him. I can't see that practically because the main thing is to just be on the edge of the desert so basically you can accommodate everybody to sit and listen to him. This is all about space because he's needing people, he's needing the space to have everybody sitting around listening to him. He can't do it in a, a town or a village because it's, it's, it's just like, we can't, you know, it's like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, it'd be a nuisance. It'd be a nuisance. The police would say, yeah, you know, you, you're an obstruction, Jesus. You can't preach here. We can't have all these people. It's, it's just the Romans wouldn't like it. They'd move him out. They wouldn't let him. They'd say, look, you know, you, you, this is disorder as far as the Romans would be concerned. They can't have him preaching in a town because, and then you've got hundreds, perhaps thousands, you know, as we're led to believe in the Gospels. You can't have 5,000 people gathered in a small village or a town or anywhere and Jesus preaching. It's, it's disorder as far as the Romans are concerned. He needs to just be in, walk, get into that desert area just there. People just sit there in the desert area. So the Romans won't be bothered about that. They say, well, he's either in the desert, it's okay. As long as they're not making a nuisance in the town or villages. Because they've got to keep law and order in the towns and villages. You can't have... People, you know, you can't have mass crowds in a, any town or village when it's under occupation. It was occupied by Rome, remember. So that's why you'd have to go into the desert, because he wants to draw a large crowd so that the word gets round, he's going into the desert. But when he's going into the desert, he's not going to go right into the, you know, like 10 miles or something, and everybody's getting across the desert. No, 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 no. I think he would have just got into the area perhaps about, you know, even a quarter of a mile, even less than that, less than that. He's just within the start of the desert and then people are all skating round up there. They're round him and there he is. He's just on the edge. He's, he's away from the towns and villages so he can't be, you know, the... He's out of sight of the Romans, you know, and he's in this space of the desert where the Romans are interested in the desert. And if they want to sit in the desert, that's their business. We're not interested in that. As long as they don't clog up our towns and villages because we need to keep law and order. Now, according to the Gospels, they're saying that these people did not think to bring any food or water. I don't believe this. Think about it. This is the Middle East. This is a hot country. Whenever you make a journey, I mean, if you're living in a cold country, you take provisions with you. If you're going out for the day, you take a flask, you take water, you take sandwiches, you take packets of crisps, you take. You take a Mars bar, you take apples, you take the, just the stuff people take with them. Um, I cannot imagine 5,000 Jewish people <laughs> going anywhere and not having some food, not some nothing, nothing to gnash. 5,000 Jewish people going somewhere with nothing to gnash or drink. No, 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 no. No, that just don't, does not happen. That would not happen. No, no, no. <laughs> That's it. physically impossible. 
that is a hundred percent physically impossible that five thousand Jewish people would go into a desert area with no food or water they're going out for the day to listen to a preacher to listen to some big math to some rabbi to some big shot there's always always this site go and listen to the de in the desert we might go let's go everybody else is going it might be interesting it's different it's a day out let's so everybody take the jewish ways you take the food you take the water you take the bagels have we got some kichels have we, we've got some brisket we want some have you got some chopped and fried i've got some this have you, have you got the pickled cucumber have you got some mustard and this and the, the food they are not going to go out into the desert with no food and water that is ridiculous that is ludicrous that is nonsensical that is rubbish that is totally completely rubbish And from a pure common sense point of view, because if you go anywhere for the day, you take food and water. You go to a pop festival, you go to a concert, you're out, out a classical concert, you go to a rock concert, you go to a demonstration, you go anything, you take the water, don't you? You take a flask. You take food, you take, you see people, don't you, eating, drinking, they're on a demonstration, popcorn, loads of food. There is no way 5,000 Jewish people will be going out anywhere, nowhere, with no food and no water. And do you know why the text is saying that? Do you know why the gospel writer is saying that? is because he wants the reader and the listener to be reminded of the Jewish people fleeing Egypt because when they left Egypt God said don't take anything with you right don't take anything with you so they fled Egypt God parted the Red Sea they had nothing to eat nothing to drink and God fed them and he watered them out in the wilderness right this is why the gospel writer has specifically said that 5,000 people have not thought to bring any food or water into a desert. Can you believe that? A hot country. Nobody in a hot country makes any journey without water and food. It's just ridiculous. People don't do it in a cold country, never mind a hot country. So, we've got the fish that, put, that, that Peter presents to Jesus. We've got nothing to eat. All we've got is two pieces of fish, uh, two pieces of bread. So, God, uh, Jesus would lift up the bread and he would say a prayer. He'd say, Baruch atodonoi heinu melech olam. Thank you, O Lord, my God, creator of the universe, for giving us the bread of the earth to eat. And what does bread of the earth to eat remind you of? It reminds you of God providing manna in the form of that Jew, every day for 40 years in the desert for the Jewish people. That Jew, you taste of it, it's come from the earth, it's wheat. It's bread. It's bread. Just because it's not in sliced, you know, just because it's not round. You can make bread into any shape you like. It can be totally flat. It can be totally flat, like a pita bread. It can have no yeast in it and be like matzah, unleavened bread. Because unleavened bread is bread without yeast in it. If, it. if it doesn't have yeast in it, it won't rise. So, 
if you want to make bread, unleavened bread, you just get some flour, add water, and that's it. Mix it and put it in the oven. It's simply wheat, ground wheat and water cooked. Right, it won't rise. If you, if you mould it into a shape, it will come out the same shape. It won't rise. It won't be like the shops. It will stay as it is. It won't rise. You, when you've mixed the, the bread and water, because I do bread making, you don't have to make it into the shape of you think of the bread, like, you know, round or square or twist or plaited. You don't have to do that. You can have it flat, totally flat, and you can have it as thin as you like. You can take that mixture and turn it into any shape you like. You could you could get a, a cookie cutter and make it into little cookie shapes. You could get them into little funny animals. It doesn't matter. When it's cooked, it would just it would taste like bread. It might look like a gorilla. It might look like an elephant. It doesn't matter. It's still bread. It's exactly the same as that dew on the land in the desert that that God fed them with. That is the same bread. It's the same. Exactly the same. It's just presented differently. It's presented flat on the ground. It's exactly, exactly, exactly the same. It will taste the same. It's wheat. It's wheat. And that's why Jewish people say that prayer. Because the bread has come from the earth. What you have to remember about the bread that was in the hands of Jesus was that bread was actually cooked. That bread was actually cooked. In other words, that bread had been made from flour and water and more than likely it had yeast in it. So it would have been high. That gives it the height. And it makes it sort of softer, sort of. Um, and also, that's why it can bloat you a bit. If you get trouble with bread bloating, then one way of dealing with bloating is to have unleavened bread dough. Make your own bread dough, add the yeast to it. Because yeast causes things to rise. So, of course, you don't know what the, how much yeast are putting in bread nowadays. So if you have a problem and you're worried about bloating or you're just concerned that I, I don't want any bloating and I want to try and keep a flat stomach, don't have bread with yeast in it. Buy, have buy unleavened bread. Make your own. Just get the water. Wholemeal flour and water. And you can add anything you like to flour and water. Do you know that? You can add anything. And in the desert, what would have happened when the children of Israel, they would have got that dew and they would have been trying to mix things with it to make it more tasty, as I said, the leaves and different things. Anything, you know, any berries or anything, they'd be think they'd be first of all take a little bit to check it's not poisonous and then they might be adding it to the dew, cooking it. You, do, you can do all sorts. You can add anything to the, the dough of bread, of, uh, uh, of, of flour and water. Honey, salt, anything. You can have a spicy bread, you can have herb bread, you can anything. Now, this is where we're moving into the magic area. Yeah, and what I'm suggesting is magic because Jesus is not demonstrating any control or sovereignty over the elements. If the text had said and the, everybody was hungry and there was no food and then Jesus said a prayer over some bread and then somebody 
ran over to Jesus and said, look, I've just found something over here. It's some sort of funny stuff on the ground. And then if people start tasting it, and they, oh, it tastes like bread. That didn't happen. I would have expected that to happen. If Jesus was divine, I would have expected that to happen. Because that's what God did in the wilderness for the Jewish people. He actually provided the manna from the ground. He, he did it naturally. And I would have expected in that situation of 5,000 people, if it had happened, if it was supposed to be true, there's no food, they're out in the desert. Jesus has said a prayer over two loaves. For some reason, they're just only two loaves. 5,000 people. 5,000 people have not thought to bring any food at all. But Peter has just thought, he's the only one, the thought of bringing two loaves and two finishes is all we've got. Right. So he says the prayer. I would then expect that what happened in to the children of Israel in the in the desert, I would have expected that to be happening again with the five the feeding of the five thousands. I would have expected that to have happened again. Because I would be the only way to convince people that this man was somehow possibly divine or something like in that realm. But he hasn't done that. He hasn't done that. What Jesus has done, unlike not unlike the magician with the empty hat, He's brought out a rabbit. I don't know how to take, get those rabbits out of those empty hats. I'd love to know. They, they, there is, they, they, there's something going on. But I don't know how to do it. But you've seen it on television. You've probably seen, maybe seen it live. And people just don't, where's it coming? All these rabbits coming out of an empty hat. Where's it coming from? The, the hat is empty, they're showing it you. It's a more, a more rabbit. That is magic. And I see this a correlation with this magic of the rabbits out of the hat to the duplication of this bread that was supposed to have taken place. Because it would seem to me, from the way that God has demonstrated how he works in the Hebrew Scriptures, is he kind of works through the natural, isn't he? Taking control of the natural, so that the wheat's there. Because remember, as I've said right at the beginning, it's wheat has come from the earth, so the children of Israel were fed from the dew that was on the earth was the wheat from the earth, which was bread. It was all natural. So God was taking control of the elements. Jesus is not taking control of the elements here. And I think this is the flaw of this story. Because I would have expected that. And I think any Jewish reader would have ex and listener would have expected the same to happen again. That's what they would be waiting to hear. That's what probably what the the rabbis, if they heard about, you know, if, people, if it's supposed to have happened, they would have been expecting to have heard that. They would have been expected to have seen that. They would have expected people to bring it to the rabbis and say, this is what he did and this is what he fed us with. Where's the evidence? You see, it would have been presented, it had to be presented to the rabbis. They, don't tell me there weren't rabbis there amongst the 5,000. There's no way there wouldn't be a single rabbi there. And that's what the rabbis would be looking for. If this was, gonna, if this was supposed to be happening. They would be looking 
for the exact same thing that happened to the children of Israel in the desert to be happening again. If he's supposed to have fed them, the rabbis would have expected him to be them to be fed in exactly the same way. But Jesus didn't do that. According to this story, it's like the magician with the magic hat, bringing out the, the rabbits and multiplying the bread. And so for this reason alone, I, and the other reasons, I think this was magic because it doesn't tally with the way, the ways that how God works in the Hebrew scriptures. And the New Testament has to follow and be in exact agreement with the template of God as he reveals and demonstrates his power and how he works in the Hebrew Bible. So everything has to be tested against the Hebrew scriptures. And that's why I'm asking, I'm asking you to consider and I'm raising these points because in order to determine what is a miracle and what is a magic, and there is a difference, Magic does exist. God knows it exists. He says it exists. It's there in the Hebrew Bible. And he says have nothing to do with it. It does exist. But it is different to God. Magic is not the same as the miracles of God. It is different. There is a difference and you can recognise a difference. The idea that you can't recognise a difference is simply not true. Because the pound note, the counterfeit, and the genuine. The person who studies a, a genuine dollar, a genuine pound note, can see the difference between the genuine and the counterfeit. Between the counterfeit, between the, the magician snakes and the snake representing the power of God who ate up the magician snake. The children of Israel were fed by God with manna coming up from the earth, which is how manna comes up. Bread comes from the earth naturally, natural thing God harnessing. Jesus isn't doing that. He's taking a ready-made loaf made with wheat and water. It's ready-made, it's cooked, and he's supposed to be duplicating it. And that, to me, smacks of magic. So I hope this has been uh, interesting and I hope this is thought provoking because in all my times, 42 years of a Jewish believer, there was never any discussion, never any questions about any of this, any of this. Um, um, and it's understanding how things happen doesn't make, um, diminish the fact that it's a miracle it's still a miracle if God can part the Red Sea and keep it upright so the children of Israel can can go through that is a miracle what I'm trying to do is and what other people are trying to do is help you understand it right I'm helping you understand it and you say yeah actually I can see it now it's it it it, it so then you it's it is actually believable so and that does, but it doesn't make it doesn't make it any less miraculous. It doesn't make it any less less miraculous if you can understand how God flooded Egypt with with locusts. It doesn't make it any less incredible. It's amazing. Um. 
And I suppose this is the difference between Christianity and Judaism. Um, fundamentally, is we ask questions and we like to understand. And there is nothing, nothing wrong with, with understanding or getting a glimpse of how God kind of perhaps could do things. It doesn't diminish it. It doesn't have to be a total mystery, as like Christianity seems to think that you must part of that to, 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 to means always being ignorant and not understanding. I suppose what I'm suggesting is it is actually possible to understand. It is possible to perhaps make sense of, well, how did God flood the earth at the time of Noah? Well, he got it raining. It started to rain and rain and rain and rain and rain and rain and rain. It doesn't make it any less incredible. Does it? It doesn't diminish the 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 the, 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 the magnificence of it. The, the, so wow, wow, what's going on here? And this is why you get the the expression "act of God." And it's probably when God is working through the created order that gets people in awe of God, because they can see. That something is taking control of different elements of creation of the water, of the ocean, of the sea, of the sun, of the of everything, and things are happening. And people realise there's a greater power out there that's managing it. So it's not actually about we getting you to lose your faith in God. It's actually it's like. Wow, isn't he amazing that he can do all that? That he's actually able to harness the everything up there and to get to flood the earth, then to get the earth dried out again. I mean, it's, it's all God. It's all the power of God harnessing everything. And the same with feeding the children of Israel from the manna, from the dew, from the dew, from the earth. I'm sorry for talking so long and I, I hope this hasn't been a waste of your time and that uh, you find it thought-provoking. Thank you very much for listening.